All right. So last lesson, we talked about Sigmund Freud and psychoanalytic perspectives on personality. And we're going to pick up where we left off. And this time, we're going to talk about either Freud's students or contemporaries uh, and their perspectives on personality. What I find interesting is that many of Freud's students and contemporaries actually made his work more user-friendly. And some of the changes that they made helped advance how we understand personality theory. So let's start. So when I use the term neo-analyst, neo-analyst, um, is in general, neo means new, analyst is analysis. So in general, these are uh, neo-Freudians, the people who followed Freud. Uh, the biggest shift here will be that there is a larger focus on the ego or sense of self as a core element of personality which is a, a marked uh, shift away from the id. You may recall when Freud was trying to understand personality, he, he put a strong emphasis on the unconscious. And in the unconscious is largely the id or your base desires. So when we talk about base desires, he was focused on things like sex and aggression. So this is a, a shift away from these base desires and more into understanding one's sense of self or self-esteem. Uh, and we're gonna talk more about that as we go. Another difference is that neo-analysts tended to be more optimistic. And one of the criticisms we said about Sigmund Freud was that he tended to focus on pathology. And the primary focus of treatment was to go from the pathological to normal. And many of the people we're gonna talk about today want you to go from normal, whatever that means, to uh, reaching your potential. And uh, Alfred Adler is one person in particular that uh, really shifts away from the Freudian thought. All right, so let's start with Carl Jung. So Carl Jung was originally viewed as a uh, prized pupil of Sigmund Freud. And he was a strong advocate, but what happens is when Carl Jung starts to differ in his sense of the unconscious, Freud starts to separate himself from, from this. Now, uh, another element of many theorists is that their personal experiences impacted the theories that uh, they developed. So uh, in terms of Jung, he believed that he had uh, two aspects or two different personalities, not in the sense of multiple personality disorders or dissociative identity, but uh, more or less that these were two elements of who he was. So he felt that he was the child that he outwardly appeared to be. And then he felt like he was uh, an old soul. So a gentleman from a previous century. And that's how he viewed uh, his childhood. And another thing that he understood uh, was dreams. And, you know, we talked about dream analysis with Freud. While Carl Jung felt that dreams were more of communications from beyond, a sense of, I don't want to use the word prophecy, but some level of tapping into the larger fabric of creation. And uh, based on that, dreams 
were linked to the collective unconscious, as I will explain what that is shortly. Now, remember Freud had uh, a tripartite understanding of the mind as well, right? Freud had the id, the ego, and the superego, right? And he talked about the conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious, right? Well, Carl Jung suggested that uh, you have the conscious ego, and then you have two elements of the unconscious. You have the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. So what are they? So the conscious ego is the aspect of personality or our sense of self. And he believed by the age of four, we have some awareness of who we are. Now, the personal unconscious is very similar to Freud's understanding of the unconscious. So the unconscious were the aspects of who we are that we're not aware of, right? And it could have information that is either just lurking beneath the surface or that we actively repressed or suppressed. Now, he believed that it contains both past and future uh, information. So we have this archetype, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, which drives our direction. And the personal unconscious uh, serves to compensate or balance uh, for our conscious attitude. So it's the, the yin yang approach. Now the collective unconscious, this is one of the things that got him in trouble with Freud. The collective unconscious was a deeper level of the unconscious that is shared with humanity. So we might be able to tap into things from past lives. And according to Carl Jung, uh, our collective unconscious is based on a pattern or series of responses from our ancestors. And based on how they responded, it leads us to respond in a very typical way or a similar way. So it's interesting, right? So the unconscious, the personal unconscious is related to you. The collective unconscious brings you more connected to previous um, uh, previous lives or uh, your ancestors. And he also talks about archetypes were, which are inherited tendencies within the collective unconscious, which predispose us to respond very similar to uh, our ancestors. Now, uh, interesting to note, evolutionary psychologists would probably say something very similar. Now, they wouldn't refer to this as a function of the unconscious, they would say this is a function of DNA and genes being passed on from one generation to the next. But uh, Carl Jung was talking more on a mentalistic level. All right, so within the archetypes, what are they? Now, um, there are many different archetypes, and I'm going to focus on four general archetypes. This is not exclusive, but uh, nevertheless, these are what Carl Jung uh, proposed. So you have the anima and the animus. Now, the animus with the S is the masculine side of women. And the anima is the feminine side of a man, right? So uh, Carl Jung believed that we had a, a blending of both masculinity and femininity within us. So uh, depending on how prominent it was, we would, refl we would manifest it differently. Um, I'll give you, and this has nothing to do with um, gender identity, according to Carl Jung, but you might hear the term tomboy. 
the term tomboy uh, would likely, Carl Jung would explain that as more of a prominent animus. And uh, you might hear someone referred to as a metrosexual, which is very into grooming and perhaps they might wear nail polish, clear polish or things like that. And Carl Jung would say that that individual is more tapped into the anima. And the gender roles play, you know, they're part of this as well, of course. So this is very stereotypical in how Carl Jung understands it, but nevertheless, that's the anima and animus. You also have the persona and the shadow. Persona is the outward facing or socially desirable, socially acceptable side of yourself. So this is what drives you to behave in a way that seeks approval. And then you have the shadow, which is the deeper recesses of personality, which include the more unacceptable sides of who we are in our personality. It also includes our creativity. Then we have uh, the archetype called mother, which is responsible for fertility and productivity or generativity. And then we have the hero versus the demon. The hero is our force that pushes us towards good. And the demon is the force that pushes us towards uh, bad cruelty or evil. Now the hero and the demon might be linked to the superego and the id respectively of Freud. Uh, so these are the archetypes. Now, he also described complexes, right? So a complex is a combination or grouping of emotionally charged thoughts related to a theme. And he would provide you a word association task where he gave you a series of words and you were meant to produce whatever came to mind, what's linked to it. And based on the pattern of words that you give, he felt that he could understand uh, your complexes. So as a, an example, let's say uh, you had this word association test and you're say, say whatever comes to mind and they're gonna appear one by one. So let's say head, right? So you could say ball cap or you could say tail, right? Or feet, right? Anything, right? Uh, now green, you could say mucus, right? Or apple, right? Anything. Um, water, you could say drink, or you could say drown, right? Uh, death, release, right? So if someone says release, and they talked about uh, green mucus drowning, death as release, you might uh, understand them to be somewhat suicidal. That might be the complex emotion, right? But you get the idea. So if the words head were ball cap and green was apple, these are neutral words. So it probably doesn't mean much, but if you had a very um, dark responses that could indicate some other aspect of, of fantasy. All right. Carl Jung also believed that you have four major functions of the mind. So, uh, they are divided into rational versus irrational function. And the rational function, this is not meant to be judgmental. Rational just means that you utilize logic or, dis, uh, or reasoning in decision making. So the two uh, core functions related to rational thought are thinking and feeling. And that's why I said it's not meant to be judgmental, because when you think of feelings, you think of emotions, but that's not what's going on here. So thinking refers to answering the question of what is this there for, right? So thinking is more of an analytic process. 
feeling is more of an appraisal process. What is it worth or what's its value? Still a analytic, but more weighing uh, the subjective nature of it. Irrational functions. These are functions that do not require logic whatsoever. And irrational, again, is not meant to be taken as a judgment against these functions. It just doesn't require logic. So sensing is, uh, is there something there? So that, that is the closest word to its typical meaning, sensation, right? So understanding something's happening in our environment. And in intuiting, you might think intuition, your gut feeling, but that's not what's going on here either. This is more of like a sense of, well, where did it come from? Where is it going? So it's more of like understanding the antecedent or consequence, right? So these are the four functions of the mind. And then he said, you have two major attitudes, introversion and extroversion. Now, Jung believed that these are separate elements. And I will tell you that Today, we don't agree with them. We tend to see introspection, pardon me, introversion and extroversion as on a spectrum, right? A, on a continuum, but it's the same continuum, right? So, but introversion is more directing your energy inward towards what's happening inside of you. Extroversion is directing your energy outside of yourself. So, um, now, we believe that people who are introverted tend to be more reserved, uh, more, uh, they spend more time thinking in solitude, uh, and that's how they process information and make decisions, where extroverts tend to be more outgoing, sociable, and they tend to make decisions more by committee. Okay, so if you have four functions and two attitudes, and you multiply four times two, that's how many types we have. So we have eight types, right? Uh, and that's just the combination of the four functions and the two attitudes, right? And typology, according to Jung, was your the best fit of who you are and what's dominant in your personality. Now, the Myers-Briggs type inventory is an outgrowth of Carl Jung's work. And I will tell you that people uh, spend money trying to understand the Myers-Briggs or people go on to dating websites and they have them fill out the Myers-Briggs. And uh, I guess it has some value or utility, but not as much as it is made out to be. Uh, actually, the Myers-Briggs is most useful for occupational decision-making. So what was uh, Carl Jung's view on sex, right? So we talked about Freud believing that, you know, sex was uh, one of your basic drives and it was linked to your id or uh, primal impulses. And somehow it was related to your childhood experience. So we talked about the Oedipus complex or the Electra complex with Freud. Uh, but Carl Jung had a very different mindset. Uh, he, he had a much more positive view on uh, sex in general. Uh, he did not pathologize sex the way Freud did. Uh, he felt that in terms of emotional functioning, sex did not play that strong of a role. Uh, it, did, it wasn't a primary factor of your personality the way Freud suggested. And uh, as it relates to his own life, uh, Jung didn't really have too many hangups in this area either. So you could see that he spent a lot of time in the company of females. And in fact, he had affairs with several females, including some of his clients. And, you know, when I teach psychotherapy, I talk about the ethics code. And one of the general rules is that you're not allowed to be intimate with one of your clients. And if you were intimate with a person, you're not allowed to take them on as a client. And I always ask my students, well, why do we need this rule? 
And, and the answer is because in our history, people took advantage of the power differential and Carl Jung is a very good example of that. Now, in terms of libido, libido according to Freud was more of a sex drive, whereas according to Jung, libido was uh, a general energy that pushes us towards life. So it's more life force and it's there for many times, uh, many aspects of our life when we're uh, experiencing growth, uh, critical moments in our life, libido is pushing us in the direction towards life. Uh, and then the Oedipus complex, which Freud believed happens um, between the ages of three to six, roughly. Uh, Carl Jung rejected the Oedipus complex. He did not feel that young males were attracted to their mother. Um, and he said this, this was not a sexual attraction, but it is more of a normal dependency that children have with their parents, right? So, so there's a lot to be said. There are many uh, areas where he absolutely deviated from Freud. That brings me to Adler. Adler is uh, another person who kind of wound, uh, wound up in Freud's orbit. Now, whereas Carl Jung was a pupil or, or a student of Freud, Adler was, he was already pretty prominent by the time he met Freud. And uh, I believe it was 1898, he wrote uh, a book on psychotherapy and how to use psychotherapy with the working man, so to speak. And when I say the working man, I mean the working class which is interesting because Freud's psychotherapy was more towards the upper class, the wealthy, and Adler's focus of therapy was the everyday person. So that's a, a point of distinction. And as I said, he wrote this book in 1898, and it was 1902, which is when Adler kind of connected with uh, Freud. And how this went down was Freud was talking about his understanding of dreams and Adler actually defended Freud's understanding of dreams, which was what brought them close. And of course, this connection lasts only about nine years before they start separating from one another. Uh, and I'll explain what happens then. But Adler is known for what's called individual psycholo psychology. So the root of individual isn't one, like as in uh, doing therapy with one person versus group therapy. The concept of individual psychology is more from the word individuum, which is indivisible. So when we talk about individual psychology, Adler believed that you have to study the whole person and you can't really dissect them into their parts like Freud tried to. Uh, he wanted to try and focus on the holistic view of an individual. All right, so now who we are and how we relate to the world uh, pretty much is impacted by our connection with uh, society, right? And, you know, Adler pushed this strong social interest. And he felt that if you're going to be a good person, you need to have some social interests or social connectedness. All right. And like Jung, Adler believed that our nature is very goal oriented. And instead of looking at pathology that Freud did, he tried to figure out how to avoid disturbances in personality or pathology. So he, he really put a focus on preventative medicine rather than treatment after the fact. So one of the major gifts that Alfred Adler 
gives psychology is his understanding of inferiority and superiority. Now, I know what you're thinking when you hear the term inferiority, it conjures a sense of insecurity. But when we use the word inferiority in the terms of Adler, inferiority is more or less some area of lesser competence. And superiority is an area of, you know, very strong competence. And in general, Adler believed in superiority striving, which was the nature to take areas of weakness and turn them into strength. So that's inferiority, that's superiority, and that's superiority striving. Now, what I didn't define were the terms inferiority complex or superiority complex. And the reason why I did is I wanted to first talk about uh, that which is within the realm of normal, and when we talk about inferiority complex, that's when it becomes pathological, all right? Or superiority complex, that is when it's pathological, right? So an inferiority complex is more exaggerated feelings of worthlessness, helplessness, uh, incompetence, but you take what is considered a normal sense of okay, I'm not good at this, and you take it to the extreme. And so let's say uh, an area of inferiority for me would be singing, right? But it doesn't bother me that I'm not a very good singer. So I, don't, I haven't really developed an inferiority complex because I'm not a good singer. Uh, so you take these normal feelings of, lack of competence, proficiency, and you take it to the extreme, right? A superiority complex is feigned narcissism. What do I mean by that? So this is a person who also feels inferior, but on the outward side, they present a sense of bravado or arrogance to combat their sense of um, uh, lacking of self-worth, right? So it's interesting, right? So uh, that would be a superiority complex. So we talked about general inferiority as a normal process. We talked about general superiority as a, a normal process. We talked about superiority striving, which is a, the goal of taking an area of weakness and o overcompensating and turning it into some sense of competency. And then we talked about the pathological. Now, according to Adler, everybody is born with organ inferiority. Everybody has some area of physical weakness and it's how we relate to our areas of weakness, physical weakness that impacts our life choices. Now, remember what I said earlier, many of the theories that were developed were shaped by the life experiences of the individual. And what I didn't say was Adler was very sick as a kid and he was in and out of the hospital. So this concept of organ inferiority uh, is an outgrowth of his personal experience. Now, where does aggression come from? So Adler believed that our drive for aggression comes from a prolonged um, aspect of inferiority and an inability to master something. So we lash out. So we lash out because we have not been able to master something. So it's a sense of, uh, in some ways, you might argue that this is a defense mechanism for lack of mastery. Now, uh, the terms masculine protest uh, was uh, our sense for striving towards independence. Now, before I explain this, 
I do want to say that Adler was a very early feminist. It's possible that it's due to his wife, uh, who was also a prominent writer in feminist theory very early. But when we use the term masculine protest, he's talking about how society views things. So femininity was referred to as inferiority, masculinity was referred to superiority within the larger social perspective. Now, uh, mask, the masculine protest would be to strive towards independence. Now, he did not believe that men were inherently superior to women as Freud did, uh, but he did use the terms of masculinity as superiority to speak the language of the day. Now, we also have this sense of perfection striving, which is setting goals for ourselves. And the tricky part of perfection striving is that once we accomplish a goal, we raise the bar on ourselves. And this idea of trying to reach our goal or reach the next goal goes on indefinitely. So uh, if you were to speak to someone early in their career, they might shock themselves on what they accomplished later in their career by looking back because they didn't know that they could accomplish goal X. Once they accomplished goal X, they moved on to goal Y. Um, and then in terms of the goals we set for ourselves, it depends on how we see ourselves. So these fictional goals of being uh, perfect or uh, accomplishing what we want to accomplish, it varies from person to person, depending on your capacity, depending on one's inherent abilities and so forth. So whatever our goals are, are tailored to who we are. Now, all of that is pretty reasonable. One of the areas where Adler kind of steps in it is his understanding of birth order. And Adler believed that depending on which child you were in the family, that affected your personality. And even before I get into it, research suggests that birth order has very little to do with who you are and your personality. So he was wrong, or dare I say he overstated the case. So what do you do when you have multiple children. So let's try and break it down sort of like firstborn, middle child or middle children, and then lastborn. So the firstborn has the opportunity to live some of their life as the favored child because they're the only child. However, one of the challenges that the firstborn has to do deal with is when another child is born. Eventually, they have to share the spotlight. And how they deal with sharing the spotlight is going to affect their personality. And Adler believed that if you effectively learn to share the spotlight, the firstborn, it tends to be more of a leader, tends to be more independent than their siblings, and so forth. The second born or the middle child, they're born already into an environment where there is someone else there. So they're born into a situation of rivalry and competition, right? Because they have to compete for the love and attention of the parents or caregivers that the firstborn had originally. Now, this rivalry or competition can result in inferiority or lacking of self-worth, feeling lost in the family, but it also could lead to standing out and accomplishing tremendous things or great accomplishments. Uh, so it, how you relate to that rivalry can be either positive or negative. 
And the baby of the family or the last born is usually more pampered. Uh, they tend to have already, you know, they're nurtured. So uh, that comes with some consequences too. They might feel like they have to succeed at everything. So being an overachiever, or they might develop um, some insecurities or defeatist attitudes. Now, as I said, even before going into this, Adler's perspective on birth order is inconsistent with what the science suggests. Our parenting of our children matters more than when the child was born into the family. Birth order has minimal impact on personality. Now, Adler had his own typology. And when we think of his typology, he linked it to the four humors uh, or bodily fluids. Uh, so there were understanding of, you know, psychological wellness as a function of one's fecal matter or mucus or blood. And long story short, Adler believed that uh, depending on your social interests and your level of activity, you fell into four categories and they would be linked to these, you know, Greek humors uh, that we talked about early on. So if you had low social interests and you were very driven you would be considered more of a ruling or dominant personality type. So social interest is trying to be connected with the community, right? Uh, if you had low social interest and low activity, now you're more passive. So you would be a getting or leaning personality type. If you had very low social interests and low activity, you would be an avoiding uh, personality type. And the goal would be to be socially useful, which is the final personality type where you had high uh, social interests, high connectedness to the community and high activity. So these were the four types. So what are some of the issues. Well, I think that when Adler shifted the focus away from the id to the whole person, the composite self, that really set Freud off. And in 1911, they, you know, they had a falling out. Adler resigned from Freud's Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. Now, this Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, they would meet weekly in Freud's house. And he said, you know what? I don't need this. And he created his own uh, lens of psychoanalysis, which he called his own society, Society for Free Psychoanalysis, which eventually got renamed as the Society for Individual Psychology. All right. He also, in addition to trying not to focus on the id, he also disagreed with Freud about the power of these basic drives of sex and aggression as predictors of behavior. So he felt that how we respond to a situation is far more complex than these two basic drives. All right. Then we have Karen Horney. Karen Horney is an interesting figure within the field of psychoanalysis. Um, she was also an early feminist. Uh, now, she experienced tremendous loss and lack of support from her family. So she lost her mother and then her dad remarried someone who was 18 years younger than him. 
So here she is growing up as an adolescent and her stepmother is uh, within her age range. So that created some complex emotions. Karen Horney did not feel that she was very attractive as a person and her stepmother was very attractive. So that created a sense of uh, insecurity. We also see that when her dad remarried, he had many other stepchildren, which meant that she had less, you know, less of a role in the family. All of this is trying to get at some of why Karen Horn, I believe some of the things she did. Uh, another thing related to this was when um, she wanted to go to high school, her father was pretty unsupportive and he, he didn't feel that women needed high school uh, because what are they going to do after all, right? They're going to have babies in his mind. So she defied her father and eventually he acquiesces. And uh, she was one of the first women to get an advanced high school degree. And ultimately she gets a doctoral degree, right? So she really breaks free. But the misogyny of her father plays a role in her reaction to Freud's theory of penis envy, which I'll get to shortly. So you may recall from the previous lecture that Freud believed that females were um, bothered by the fact that they don't have a penis and um, females were somehow viewed as inferior to males. And Karen Horney was like, this whole idea is ridiculous. And she felt that the female genitals were not inferior. And she flips the argument on its head. And she said, instead of there being uh, penis envy, uh, actually men have womb envy because women have the capacity to create life and bear children. And that is equally flawed, right? Research suggests Freud's concept of penis envy is overstated and Karen Horney's view of womb envy is overstated. But I bring up Karen Horney because, you know, her passion to work towards a more equal and a, or egalitarian society shaped some of her ideas. But remember how I talked about her upbringing. So that had a profound impact on her. And she talks about this concept of basic anxiety, which was uh, children feeling either hopeless, helpless, or alone in the world. And she argued that this basic anxiety occurs usually due to there being a cold experience in the family. And she experienced a lot of this coldness from her father, right? So this lack of warmth uh, create, creates anxiety or uncertainty. And she felt that, you know, this anxiety could either be focused inward, turned on oneself or focus outward. And she presents um, coping styles. She said, and she redefines them and shapes them, but Here's the original model. She felt that uh, some people cope with this anxiety by developing a passive style, which is complying with those around them. Some people cope with this anxiety by becoming more aggressive, so they fight with authority. And some people cope with this anxiety by removing themselves or withdrawing from society, right? So they disengage. Uh, now, this model is overly simplistic, but she did add an important message that it's so incredibly important for us as parents to create a warm home environment for our kids. Harshness 
criticism, feelings of being alone or helpless uh, are, are damaging, are damaging to our children. Now, she also talks about the sense of self. And when we talk about the self, that's a more, on a more holistic point of view. But she said there are four aspects of the self, the despised self, the real self, the actual self, and the ideal self. The despised self is the aspect that draws upon feelings of inferiority, as Adler talked about, or shortcomings. But the despised self, we internalize the feelings of others. So this is based on other people's view of us. The real self, which is the goal, is that we want to be in touch with our real self, is you know, where we can identify the poten our potential, our potential for growth, or um, you know, strivings for great things. That's the, uh, the real self. But if you have parental abuse, neglect, maltreatment, that's going to interfere with the development of the real self. The actual self is the physical person that is outside of evaluation. So if we were going to look at the despised self versus actual self, the actual self is uh, disconnected from other people's point of view, whereas the despised self is based on other people's feedback. And then the ideal self is uh, the goals we have and who we want to become. Now, it's interesting that I said the goal of therapy is to be connected with the real self. Now, why not the ideal self of who you want to become? You know, it's interesting that even the goals we set for ourselves can predispose us for negative attitudes. We can have unrealistic goals for ourselves. So the purpose of the real self is to be connected with where we are and who we are in life. So that's why the real self uh, would be embracing uh, who you are. All right, so we talked about coping styles earlier. I'm gonna go backwards to remind you. We talked about the passive style, the aggressive style and a withdrawing style. She modifies her coping uh, styles and she changes the language to moving towards, moving against and moving away as your coping styles. And what that does is she links up the aspects of the self with coping. And that's why she modified it. So moving towards would be those who over identify with the despised self. Now remember the despised self was the internalized criticism of others. So people who are people pleasers, who are conflict averse, who always wanna make other people happy, they're going to strive to uh, get the approval of others, whether it be their love, affection, and so forth, um, because internally uh, they don't see themselves that way. So they need the approval of others. So they're gonna over identify, move towards other people to get their approval. Moving against, moving against was a person who uh, over identifies with their ideal self. Now this person is likely to strive towards power and control, right? So the ideal self, um, you know, is where you, who you want to be, but moving against is like, well, I deserve this, so to speak. And then moving away is those who uh, want to overcome their sense of despised self, but feel hopeless and don't feel like they can accomplish this. So they withdraw. All right. So that's Karen Horner. Now, another key person uh, is Anna Freud. Now, Anna Freud doesn't get enough credit. You know, when Sigmund Freud, her father, was talking about 
early childhood development affecting you in adulthood, that was largely speculative, right? So he talked about fixations and whatnot, but what Anna Freud does is she creates this child guidance clinic and she starts working with children directly. And she was able to demonstrate that that which her father said, early childhood development affects you at later points in time was true. So she actually created more validity to that claim. Now, one thing that she did was she also put more of a, you know, an emphasis on social influences and the ego. Now, she wasn't as much driven based on the id as her father. Um, she did agree that the ego was kind of still that mediator between pardon me, the ego was the meteor between the id and the superego. But she also felt that it was proactive too. So it wasn't just a passive response. Um, picture on the right is Sigmund Freud and Anna Freud together. Uh, I put this picture there uh, because I, it wanted to remind me to tell you that when Sigmund Freud got sick, um, his daughter was his primary caregiver. So she had a very close connection with her father. Um, and uh, yeah, so she, she pretty much did everything for him. So draw a line in your notes. And now I wanna shift gears a little bit to Heinz Hartman. Hartman is considered the father of ego psychology, right? And he felt that the ego was far more autonomous than Freud claimed. And actually, instead of the id and the superego being the battling forces, it's actually the id and the ego that were um, kind of compensatory or battling back and forth and being opposite sides of one another. Now, shifting gears to uh, object relations. So um, what you're going to see by the end of the lecture is that we talked about self-psychologists, ego-psychologists, object relations psychologists, right? Um, and these are many of the, the branches of Freudian thought. So object relations believe that uh, exactly as the words sound like, our connection with others help shape our view of ourselves. And uh, Margaret Mahler talked about this symbiotic relationship between the child and their caregiver in terms of attachment. So in a normal symbiotic relationship, kids develop healthy bonds with their caregiver. They learn to love their caregiver, but uh, be able to separate themselves from their caregiver, or be distinct from them. But you can have a symbiotic psychotic relationship, which is more of an enmeshed pattern where you're overly connected with your pattern, with your parent, pardon me, and this could interfere with the development of the self or the holistic view of who you are. Uh, and last but not least, um, she talked about children on the autism spectrum are those individuals who can't form bonds, right? So they shut themselves off from the rest of the world. Uh, so these are different ways to relate to our caregiver. Now, Melanie Klein talks about part objects and whole objects, right? So when we say a part object, the let's go what Freud said in the oral stage, right? The oral stage, uh, the biggest issue is feeding practices, typically breastfeeding. So Melanie Klein takes this idea and says that the mother's breast is a part object and infants look at the, the feeding practices of their, their, their mother to determine whether it's a warm and happy place. So if the part object is positive, they develop a bond. If not, they develop suspicion, right? Now, eventually as kids get older, they learn to connect 
the part, the breast is connected to the, the mother. And then they learn to use the mother as a symbol for the rest of the world, right? So um, the breast can be a source of gratification or it could be hostile, right? Heinz Kohut. Kohut is another major player, and he did a lot of work on narcissistic personality disorder. And he felt that uh, narcissistic personality disorder happened because parents rejected their kids. So kids would try and become grand or great, however you want to say it, to get their parents' approval. And as a function of that, the role of the therapist is kind of to, to model a more accepting parent, right? Because we symbolize as therapists, potentially the parents that you had. And if we can be more accepting and encouraging of you, then you can learn to accept yourself without needing to have so much grandiosity. Um, now, he also coined a term idealizing transference which um, that's when a client sees a therapist more of like a parent love object. All right, shifting gears to Eric Erickson. Uh, Eric Erickson absolutely desexualizes the stages. So when we talked about Freud, Freud had the psychosexual stage theories of development. Eric Erickson has the psychosocial stage theory of development. So uh, it's a big shift that it shifts from the id to the ego. That's one major shift. And it shifts from your final stage of development happening somewhere in adolescence to your, you having development across the lifespan. So major shift. And long story short, at each of these eight stages, you have an ego skill that needs to be mastered. If you're successful, it predisposes you for success at the later stages. If you're unsuccessful, it sets you up for um, more challenges at a later point. Now, it is possible for someone to unsuccessfully go through a stage and then later in their life, resolve that problem, right? In fact, uh, therapists sometimes uh, reparent the inner child, so to speak, and help you go back and accomplish some of the things that you struggled with. So let's go through the eight stages. And Erickson's thoughts are usually divided into the earlier stages or the later stages. So the four early stages our trust versus mistrust, that typically happens from about birth to one. And the goal, the ego skill that the child is supposed to accomplish is a sense of hope or trust. So you're trying to determine whether the world is a safe and stable place or whether the world is an unpredictable or chaotic place. Now, how do you determine whether the world is a safe and predictable place or uh, a chaotic place? It has to do with parenting, right? So if your parents respond in an active way to your needs on a consistent basis, you will learn from your parents that the world is a, a consistent, safe place. But if your parents are inconsistent in their parenting, and sometimes they take care of you, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're more neglectful, then you might develop a sense of mistrust and learn that the world is unstable, learn that the world is unpredictable. So that is the major thing that you're trying to accomplish is a sense of hope and trust. Then your second stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. So this we're looking at about one to three. And the word autonomy means to be self-governed. How many of you have heard the term, the terrible twos? The terrible twos is when your kid 
decides that they're going to say no to you or defy you, or they're gonna climb the walls. And part of the issue, it's not actually terrible. Part of what they're trying to do is develop a sense of will or make decisions for themselves. Now, obviously they can't make many decisions for themselves, but they're learning to find their voice. And I always encourage uh, people to allow their kids to pick out their clothes. Right, because that's something that a kid can do. Now, don't do what some parents do is allow them free reign to pick whatever they want. Set out three nice outfits that match, right? Um, and then allow them to choose from those three. Because when you do that, they get a sense of trusting themselves. Now, remember the first stage was trust versus mistrust. That was trusting the world. Autonomy versus shame and doubt is learning whether you can trust yourself. Now, obviously, if you don't trust the world, you're going to be more predisposed to have more doubt about yourself. And if you do trust the world, you're going to have more trust in your own decision making. So sometimes the terrible twos have what to do with a child that it feels safe and assertive. That's a good thing. Then you have the preschool years, which are about three to five, which you have this initiative versus guilt. And what's really cool is you start to see creativity, imagination and uh, like fantasy play in kids. So now you might see them create new purposes for things that you would have never thought of. So let's say that they want to play um, a, I don't know, medieval castle scene, but they don't have a horse. They don't have armor. They might go into the kitchen and get a pot and a ladle to be their helmet and their sword and a pillow to be their horse. And all of a sudden they've repurposed all of these uh, household items. That is initiative. That's what we mean by initiative. So if you trust the world and you trust yourself, you're gonna be more willing to demonstrate creativity and use novel ways of playing. If you don't trust the world and you don't trust yourself, then you're gonna be more climbed up. And this comes to a head once you go to school. See, when you go to kindergarten, now this is one of the first times that you start to compare yourself relative to other people. So we're talking about elementary school, five or six to about puberty. The goal is to develop a sense of industry. <coughs> And an industrious person is one who is competent. What's the flip side? It's possible that when you compare yourself to other people in the classroom, you might feel incompetent or inferior. And these are the kids who usually, you know, put their hoodies on and hide in the back of the room because they don't feel competent. But Let's continue this pattern that I was doing. You trust the world, you trust yourself, you develop some creativity. Now you go into the classroom, you get to harness that by performing well in the classroom. You learn that you can't trust the world, you can't trust yourself, you shy away from unconventional approaches, by the time you go to the classroom, you, you might um, distance yourself. So these are your typical early patterns. Now, what happens during the teenage years or adolescence is you try and figure out who you are. So this is a, from puberty to early adulthood. Now you want to figure out who you are and how you fit in relative to your peers on a social level. 
Now, one of the things that will drive your parents mad in your teenage years is some of the self-exploration and experimentation that you might do. So you might come home with your hair dyed purple. And if your parents are very conservative, that might freak them out. But that's okay, because you're just trying to figure out who you are and what not. You might change your, your clothing and how you dress or the music you listen to. And the more concerning thing is risky behavior. Teenage years, as a way of trying to figure out who you are, you might experiment with sex and drugs, and you might experiment with like thrill-seeking behaviors like speed racing down the highway when you first get your license. All of these things are trying to figure out who you are. Now, most people do eventually figure out who they are. But some people become a chameleon. They develop role confusion. They don't ever figure out who they are. And so they wind up becoming wishy-washy depending on who they're with and molding themselves based on the people uh, that they're around. Now, I said, trying to figure out who you are requires you, even though it's gonna drive your parents mad, requires you to try and explore and try different versions of the self out. And if you are watching this video, I want you to think back to your first day of high school. And I want, I want to ask you, what was the most stressful time of the school day? And I, I've been teaching now almost 16 years, and the answer comes in pretty consistently, lunch. And you're like, lunch? What's wrong with lunch? Well, you see, when you were in middle school, you were a big fish in a small pond. Everybody knew your name. Now, when you go to high school, there are thousands of kids, unless you go to a private or parochial school, thousands of kids. And then you go into the lunchroom and you're looking around, trying to find someone you know from middle school. But many times they're not there right? They might be in a different class. They might have a different lunch period. So now you have to figure out, well, what table are you going to sit at? And who you sit with is going to be part of your identity. So you're going to look around. And for this lesson, I'm going to be very stereotypical, more for sensational purposes. But let's imagine that you go to school on Monday. You look around, you're looking for a table, and then you sit down. And you're sitting down with a whole bunch of strangers, and somehow they seem to have known each other. And you're listening to the discussion, who would win in a fight, Superman or Batman? And you're like, gee, I don't really watch comics. I don't, I'm, I'm not into Comic-Con. So you sit there, you listen, and then you're like, yeah, no, that's not me, right? Tuesday comes, you look at another table, you sit down, and here's what happens. Oh, my God. The Valley Girl, right? So let's say you sit at that table, and you're like, yeah, their voice is grating, not me. Wednesday comes and then you sit down and then there are the beefcakes, the jocks who are talking about sports, but you're not really into sports. And then Thursday, you sit down and people are there and they have their taped glasses and their pocket protectors and they're talking about theoretical physics, but you're a little bit more down to earth. And by Friday, you have tried out four different tables and you're like, I'm never going to find a table that fits me. So you just say, forget it. I'm just going to sit at the first table that, um, that I see has an open seat. I'm not going to try. 
and you sit down. And instead of there being very niche people, there are a bunch of eclectic people, different interests, down to earth. And then you find your friends. And I use that analogy because that's really what adolescence is all about, trying things out, figuring out, do I want to identify with this group? Do I want to identify with that group? Is this something that interests me and so forth? So high school is a perfect time period for people to start figuring out who they are. And as I said, most people do figure it out. Fast forward to early adulthood. In early adulthood, now we're talking about your 20s to 40s. The biggest thing you're going to seek here is intimacy or love. And when I use the word intimacy, I am not talking about sex. Sex is a part of intimacy, but intimacy is a close emotional bond with a friend or, or romantic partner. So you're trying to find that closeness. And usually it culminates with love and families, right? So uh, most people between their 20s and 40s eventually settle down. They settle down and they uh, are working towards building that closeness. Now, I have a question for you. If you don't know who you are, which was the task in your adolescent years, how are you going to find someone that is right for you? So the people who know who they are, know what they value, they're going to be more likely to find a strong, stable, romantic partner. The people who don't know who they are, you're going to wonder, you're going to come into therapy wondering why you dated the same loser over and over and over, just with a different name and a different body type. Know who you are figure it out, spend some time figuring out what your values are. And then there are some people who didn't find the right person and then they stay with that person. So let's fast forward to middle adulthood. This is your 40s to 60s. How many of you have heard of the term midlife crisis, right? The midlife crisis. What does the midlife crisis look like? That's when you get the tattoo you always wanted. You get the leather jacket, the motorcycle. You get the sports car. You trade your 50-year-old wife in for 225s. You know how it goes, right? So not good, right? So how does that happen? Well, if a person didn't figure out who they are and they wound up either in a loveless relationship or many superficial relationships, they're gonna likely stagnate. What does that mean? They're going to chase empty pleasure. Whereas people who have a good sense of who they are, are pretty grounded, found a person that helps them grow and they have a, a loving relationship, by your 40s, that's your opportunity to give back to society. We refer to that as generativity, right? Get, whether it be volunteering in your churches or synagogues or mosques, whatever it might be, whether it be volunteering for professional leadership, caring for uh, a parent or loved one, this is what typically happens in middle adulthood. We start to give back. And then last but not least, the final stage. In late adulthood, we face our mortality. We realize that everybody dies and we are going to die. And there are two kinds of people at the end of their life. There are people who have ego integrity, who have a, a sense of calm or peace with dying. Not that they want to die, but they understand that dying is part of living. It's the, the final destination, right? And then there are people who 
have ego despair. These individuals are people who are distraught because at the end of their life, we all take an accounting and we ask ourselves, how did we live our life? And there's nothing worse than at the end of your life realizing that you squandered your days. You didn't do anything of substance. So imagine, I'm gonna take you on a journey. Imagine, I'm gonna go all the way back to the first stage. You were suspicious of the world. You didn't trust yourself. You lacked creativity. You did poorly in school. You'd never figured out who you are. So you never had a real meaningful relationship. And as a band-aid for never having a real deep, meaningful relationship, you sought out instant gratification and pleasure. And now you're about to die. That's a tough spot, right? That is what we talk about ego despair. Whereas a person who um, learned to trust the world, trust themselves, were fairly creative, did well in school, figured out who they were, had meaningful relationships in life, gave back to society, now they're about to die, they, they're more accepting. So these are the eight stages of Eric Erickson. And if you want a great movie that kind of shows the polarity at its extreme, I encourage you to watch the movie called The Bucket List. It has Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson, two fantastic actors. And one, and I don't wanna spoil it for you, so I'm not going to um, tell you too much about it, but one has a wholesome sense about themselves, so they have ego integrity. The other, has ego despair. And I want you to watch how they relate to each other in the movie and the kinds of things they put on their bucket list. It's powerful, it tells a good story. That's Eric Erickson. So these are just some of the Neo-Freudians. So let's evaluate this model. So what are some of the pros, the benefits of this approach? It's very goal-oriented. It puts an emphasis on a, accomplishing our goals. It acknowledges the impact of society and culture. It allows us to develop across the lifespan. Uh, it talks about the holistic sense of self and coping with our emotions. All of these are good. What are some of the drawbacks? It does not put enough emphasis on biology. It does not acknowledge as much of the fixed personality structures. Uh, you may realize that I threw a lot of names at you. So some people say it's a bunch of hodgepodge theories put together. And in its early foundations, there isn't a lot of research being done to support the ideas. So it's very abstract or vague concepts. So these are the criticisms. Now, what about free will? Well, the neo-analytic point of view and ego approach acknowledge that we do have some anchoring. We are impacted by unconscious forces. However, unlike Freud who believed in psychic determinism, uh, you can transcend these forces. You can grow beyond these drives. So what are some techniques? free association, autobiographical study, uh, exploration of self-concept. And in terms of therapy, we focus on insight. This is similar to uh, Freudian psychotherapy. Insight is critical because from better understanding of the self, we make better choices. And then obviously because there's a shift from the id to the ego, there's less of a focus on hidden meanings or drives. And that, my friends, is today's lesson. Um, the next lesson I'm gonna give is on the biological aspects of personality. And it's nice that it comes right after the neo-analytic or ego aspects of personality, because as I said, one of the criticisms is it does not put enough emphasis on bi biology. 
right? So Freud and his followers did not put enough emphasis there. So I hope you enjoyed and till next time, take care everybody.